In this lecture, we will be covering the idea of conserving nature by creating parks and preserves. The learning objectives for this lecture include understanding the original purpose of nature preserves and parks in North America, and taking an initial look at how we can restore natural areas damaged by human activities. While most forests and grasslands serve useful or utilitarian purposes, most societies also set aside some nature areas for aesthetic or recreational purposes. The idea of environments has really developed in the past 50 years. While the first parks were intended mainly for the recreation of growing urban populations, parks have taken on many additional purposes. Today, we see our national parks as playgrounds for rest and recreation, as havens for wildlife, as places to experiment with ecological management, and as opportunities to restore ecosystems. Currently, nearly 13% of the land area of the Earth is protected in some sort of park, preserve, or wildlife management area. This represents about 19 million square kilometers in 122,000 different preserves. This is an encouraging environment success story. This slide shows the significant growth of protected areas worldwide from 1907 to 2007. Different levels of protection are found in nature preserves. The World Conservation Union divides protected areas into five categories depending on the intended level of allowed human use. In the most stringent category, ecological reserves and wilderness areas, few or no human impacts are allowed. In some strict nature preserves where particularly sensitive wildlife or natural features are located, human entry may be limited only to scientific research groups that visit on rare occasions. In some live wildlife sanctuaries, for example, only a few people per year are allowed to visit to avoid introducing invasive species or disrupting native species. In the least restrictive categories, national forests and other natural re resource management areas, on the other hand, there may be a high level of human use. <clears throat> the United States, by contrast, has only about 22% of its land area in protected status, and less than one-third of that amount is in IUCN categories of one or two nature reserves, wilderness areas, national parks. The rest is in national forests or wildlife management zones that are designated for sustainable use. With hundreds of thousands of state and federal employees, billions of dollars in public funding, and a high level of public interest and visibility. U.S. public lands are generally well managed. Currently, Brazil has the largest total area in protected status of any country, more than 2.5 million square kilometers, or 29% of the nation's land, mostly in the Amazon basin, is in some protected status. <clears throat> a country with a very large reserved area is Canada's national park on Ellesmere Island. It is an example of a preserve with high wilderness values, but little biodiversity. Only 800 uh, kilometers from the North Pole, this remote park gets fewer than 100 human visitors per year during its brief three-week summer season. With little evidence of human occupation, it has abundant solitude and stark beauty, but very little wildlife and almost no vegetation. This figure compares the percentage of each major biome in protected status. Not surprisingly, there's an inverse relationship between the percentage converted to human use and the percentage protected. Temperate grasslands and savannas, such as the American Midwest, and Mediterranean woodlands and scrub, such as the French Riviera or the coast of Southern California, are highly domesticated and therefore expensive to set aside in large areas. Temperate conifer forests, think of Siberia or Canada's vast expanse of boreal forests, are relatively uninhabited and therefore easy to put into some protected category. Even parks and preserves designated with a high level of protection aren't always safe from exploitation or changes in political priorities. Serious problems threaten natural resources and environmental quality in many countries. Often, Countries with the most important biomes lack funds, trained personnel, and experience to manage the areas under their control. Even in rich countries, such as the United States, 
Some of the crown jewels of the national park system suffer from overuse and degradation. Yellowstone and Grand Canyon National Parks, for example, have large budgets and are highly regulated, but are being loved to death because they are so popular. When the United States National Park Service was established in 1916, Stephen Mather, the first director, reasoned that he needed to make the parks comfortable and entertaining for tourists as a way to build public support. He created an extensive network of roads in the largest parks so that visitors could view famous sites from the windows of their automobiles, and he encouraged construction of grand lodges in which guests could stay in luxury. Wild animals have always been one of the main attractions in national parks. Many people lose all common sense when interacting with big, dangerous animals. Now, this is not a petting zoo. In this slide, we see people wait for an eruption of Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park. Thousands of people watch these regular events each year. Can you find the ranger who's giving a geology lecture? However, humans produce many problems when visiting national parks. Snowmobiles and off-road vehicles create pollution and noise and cause erosion while disrupting wildlife in many parks. As ocean fish stocks become increasingly depleted globally, biologists are calling for protected areas where marine organisms are sheltered from destructive harvest methods. Although 5% of nearshore marine biomes are protected, as the opening case study for Chapter 1 describes, limiting the amount and kind of fishing in marine reserves can quickly replenish fish stocks in surrounding areas. In a study of 100 marine refuges around the world, researchers found that, on average, the number of organisms inside no-take preserves was twice as high as surrounding areas where fishing was allowed. In addition, the biomass of organisms was three times as great and individual animals were on average 30% larger inside the refuge compared to outside. Recent research has shown that closing reserves to fishing, even for a few months, can have beneficial results in restoring marine populations. The size necessary for a safe haven to protect flora and fauna depends on the species involved, but some marine biologists call on nations to protect at least 20% of their nearshore territory as marine refuges. Coral reefs are among the most biologically rich and endangered ecosystems in the world. Marine reserves are being established in many places to preserve and protect these irreplaceable resources. In August 2016, President Barack Obama expanded the National Monument off the coast of his native Hawaii, establishing the largest protected marine sanctuary in the world. Obama's expansion of the Marine National Monument will more than quadruple its existing size, protecting reefs, marine habitats, and other resources. The expansion will add 442,781 square miles to the monument, making it now a total of 582,578 square miles. The monument was first created by President George Bush a decade ago and has been recognized globally by UNESCO. New wildlife has been discovered there since, and the expansion is expected to protect 7,000 marine animals, including whales and sea turtles, classified as endangered species. The area will also be studied for the impacts of ocean acidification caused by climate change, according to the White House. Some parks take draconian measures to expel residents and prohibit trespassing. How can we reconcile the rights of local or indigenous people with the need to protect nature? People in some developing countries are beginning to realize that their biological resources may be their most valuable assets and that their preservation is vital for sustainable development. Ecotourism, tourism that is ecologically and socially sustainable, can be more beneficial in many areas over the long term than extractive interest, industries such as logging and mining. In many important biomes, Aboriginal people have been present for thousands of years and have a legitimate right to pursue traditional ways of life. Furthermore, 
Many of the approximately 5,000 indigenous or native cultures that remain today possess ecological knowledge about their ancestral homelands that can be valuable in ecosystem management. According to author Alan Durning, encoded in indigenous languages, customs and practices may be as much understanding of nature as is stored in the libraries of modern science. Other countries recognize that finding ways to integrate local human needs with those of nature is essential for successful conservation. In 1986, UNESCO initiated its Man and Biosphere Program, which encourages the designation of biosphere reserves or protected areas divided into zones with different purposes. Critical ecosystem functions and endangered wildlife are protected in a central core region where limited scientific study is the only human access allowed. Ecotourism and research facilities are located in a relatively pristine buffer zone around the core, while sustainable resource harvesting and permanent habitation are allowed in multiple-use peripheral regions. Many natural parks and preserves are increasingly isolated, remnant fragments of ecosystems that once extended over large areas. As park ecosystems are shrinking, however, they are also becoming more and more important for, for maintaining biological diversity. Principles of landscape design and landscape structure become important in managing and restoring these shrinking islands of habitat. For years, conservation biologists have disputed whether it's better to have a single large or several small reserves, the SLOSS -S -S debate. Ideally, a reserve should be large enough to support viable populations of endangered species, keep ecosystems intact, and isolate critical core areas from damaging external forces. For some species with small territories, Several small isolated refuges can support viable populations, and having several small reserves provides insurance against a disease, habitat destruction, or other calamity that might wipe out a single population. But small preserves can't support species such as elephants or tigers, which need large amounts of space. Given human needs and pressures, however, big preserves aren't always possible. One proposed solution has been to create corridors of natural habitat that can connect to smaller habitat areas. Corridors could effectively create a large preserve from several small ones. Corridors could also allow populations to maintain genetic diversity or expand into new breeding territory. The effectiveness of corridors probably depends on how long and wide they are and how readily a species will use them. A dramatic experiment in reserve size, shape, and isolation is being carried out in the Brazilian rainforest. In a project funded by World Wildlife Fund and the Smithsonian Institution, loggers left 23 test sites when they clear-cut a forest. Test sites ranged from 1 hectare to 10,000 hectares. Clear-cuts surround some and newly created pasture surrounds others. Others remain connected to the surrounding forest. Selected species are regularly inventoried to monitor their survival after disturbance. As expected, some species disappear very quickly, especially from small areas. Sun-loving species flourish in the newly created forest edges, but deep forest shade-loving species disappear, particularly when the size or shape of a reserve reduces the availability of core habitat. This experiment demonstrates the importance of maintaining core habitat in preserves. Forest glass gra and grasslands cover nearly 60% of global land area. The vast majority of humans that live in these biomes obtain many valuable resources and materials from them. There is some good news in our search for a balance between exploitation and preservation. Nearly 14% of the Earth's land surface is now in some sort of protected status. Although the level of protection in these preserves varies, the rapid recent increase in number and area in protected status exceeds the goals of the United Nations Millennium Project.